for the blanket, yeah. She collects it afterwards anyway, so. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Mount Corey United Methodist Church. I'm Mike Noggle, the pastor here, and so glad that you are with us this morning. Uh, we thank you for joining us online. Those of you who are signed on, we hope that you'll be blessed by spending some time with us here this morning. A few announcements before we begin on this uh, September 11th morning, which is come to be known as Patriots Day, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, but tonight is the first uh, in the new uh, series of the Women's Bible Study. It'll be at 6 p.m. Uh, downstairs uh, here at the Zion Building. Uh, it's Christianity, Cults, and Religion. Patty Welch is leading that, and they ask if you're coming to enter through this back uh, west door um, for that. Uh, so we appreciate that. Uh, this coming uh, Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. over at the uh, Pleasant View Building, uh, Pastor Parish Relations Committee is meeting. Uh, and then uh, next Sunday evening at 6 o'clock this year, we're, start, we're renewing our contemporary evening, uh, Sunday evening worship services. Uh, so uh, we moved it back an hour because it is a school day. Monday is a school day. So it's at 6 o'clock. It'll involve contemporary music. It will involve um, prayer time. It'll involve a testimony. Not by me. <laughs> you won't have to listen to me twice in one day. Uh, and it's about a 40-minute service. Those who uh, attended uh, some of them last year uh, found them meaningful. Invite all of you to come out uh, next Sunday evening at uh, 6 o'clock here in this sanctuary. Um, and speaking of next weekend, it's a big deal next weekend. The 150th anniversary of the founding of this village, Mount Cory, uh, is being celebrated next Saturday, the 17th. You got an insert in your flyer on that. For those of you who are watching us on Facebook, if this same information is in our newsletter, which is posted on our Facebook page, so you can find all that information out. Uh, it starts at 2 o'clock. Uh, with the parade through town, from starting at the elevator up to the park. Uh, both churches are going to have a, a, a float or a something in, in the uh, parade. Uh, and then the rest of the activities will be taking place at the park, including a chicken dinner, a barbecue chicken dinner, which is pre-sale only, uh, and um, uh, all kinds of other things going on today. So be looking for more information. Now, to help out with that, uh, we do need uh, some assistance uh, with bakers. Do we have enough servers or we need one or two more servers? Um, okay. So uh, on the soundboard back there, uh, the barbecue is from four to six. It's in the community building at the park. And we're providing the helpers to just serve it. And then um, we have some people at Mount Cor or at Pleasant View as well who are helping, and we need some of you here. And then also we need uh, those of you who like to bake cookies and brownies, we got a thing for you to do too, uh, because uh, we will be baking those and put them in baggies. Uh, each uh, dinner gets one of those, and as of a day or two ago, they were at over 325 tickets sold for this chicken barbecue. So we need help with, uh, with uh, brownies and cookies, so you can sign up back there. We'd appreciate it. And then on the flip side of that insert, you'll see about... Uh, did you have something, Merlin? Yes. yes. Would someone please say where you can get those tickets? The barbecue? You can contact... I think it says contact me or the office. And so well, I'll talk to you right after service. We'll get them for you. <laughs> it's a big secret if you don't if you don't look too closely at that. But but I, I I'll get with you right after, sir. So I, I know we've got uh, a couple here and a couple here and a couple there. We'll get you taken care of. Uh, 
All right, so one other thing on the back side of that uh, announcement is the uh, information about this beautiful blanket. You see it draped over the first pew here uh, that um, Nancy Crawford uh, made so wonderfully. Now, she says it's a blanket because she used the, the uh, uh, sewing machine and she didn't hand stitch all of it. But to me, it looks like a quilt. It feels like a quilt. You can call it a quilt if you want to. But <laughs> it, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, she did a wonderful job. And uh, so she and Gary have donated this. Uh, it's being raffled off. Uh, you can put your uh, slips at the bottom of that in this basket or send them out to the office. Uh, the drawing will be uh, late um, in the month. Uh, the dates are on here. I believe it's the 25th. Uh, last day to uh, get tickets is 25th, and we'll draw on the 27th. Uh, and then all proceeds of this will go to the improvements uh, regarding the furnace and uh, the doors that are going on down at the Bethel Family Life Center. And we'll be uh, also selling some of these at the, uh, at the uh, sesquicentennial celebration next Saturday. If you have an hour or so you want to help in, in selling those, um, there's a sign-up sheet back there and you can or see Nancy. Uh, we'll get you taken care of. Um, and I think that's all. In. I know that uh, on Friday, he's not here today, but little Wesley... Uh, Wesley Davis, that's uh, Joyce and Brock's son, he's having his, he had his first birthday on Friday. Uh, so happy birthday to him. Uh, for those of you who know Lee Wilkins here in town, his birthday was yesterday. I think he's at a Mennonite home. And um, Joseph Holliday is, uh, has a birthday tomorrow. And I don't remember if he's six or six. six? Very good. So he'll, he'll be six tomorrow. So, and then today uh, is my youngest daughter and her husband, their first anniversary. They got married this day last year. And uh, a few years before that, Gary and Nancy Thomas uh, got married. So happy anniversary to the two of you. I didn't say how many years, so it's just, uh, so, but happy anniversary to you. Are there any other announcements before we begin service this morning? Very well, Lana, will you prepare hearts and minds for worship?
Come before God, not leaving the world behind, but drawing it into his presence. We gather on this day of remembrance to praise and to pray, to mourn and repent, and come before God with your hearts open to the Holy One and your arms open to your neighbors. We gather on this day to proclaim our allegiance to God, to follow in the way of Jesus Christ. God alone is worthy of our ultimate loyalty. Christ alone is our Savior in this world and the world to come. Praise be to God, whose mercies are new every morning. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather today, we recall your faithfulness. We thank you that you walk with us every day, that you are always with us. In this moment, we come to you and lay our lives before you. May we honor, worship, and adore you with every fiber of our being. Father, we proclaim that you are the Holy One, the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And on this day, we join with all those who worship and confess you as Lord from generations past and present and with all the angels that sing in heaven of your greatness. Lord, we love you. Lord, we bow down and worship you. In the precious and holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Will you please join us in our opening hymn this morning, How Firm a Foundation? It's on the screen. Or if you're using a hymnal on page 529, it's verses 1, 3, and 4. If you're able, please stand. Continue on in our worship on page 189, Ferris Lord Jesus.
may be seated. It's time now to take our joys and concerns to the Lord. I have several I want to share with you uh, before we begin, and then we'll open it up uh, to others who may have uh, those that you wish to express. Uh, first of all, I uh, want to celebrate uh, and thank God for the village of Mount Cory and the celebration. It's going to happen next weekend and all that this village has meant to so many people over the decades uh, of its existence. Uh, 150 years is a wonderful thing. And uh, we uh, pray God's uh, blessing on the celebration next week and for good weather uh, for the event. Also, uh, we are also remembering and commemorating another day uh, today. Um, September 11th, 21 years ago, uh, was not like today. Um, it was a beautiful, clear, sunny day. And uh, we all know what happened in New York City and Washington, D.C. and Shanksville, Pennsylvania on that day. And uh, for those, many of those who are young, that day is just something they read about in the history books. And some of them weren't even born yet. Uh, but for most of us here, uh, it's a day that um, seems like yesterday. It's so fresh in our minds. And... Uh, for those who were directly affected, uh, who lost loved ones and friends and so on, colleagues uh, on that day, uh, that hole is something that's never uh, going to be filled. And so we need to pray for all of those uh, who are affected and uh, for our country. Also, uh, uh, pray, praise for uh, Charlotte. Ron Eller had eye surgery back on the 6th. She's going to have their other one done on the 20th. But that's not the, uh, the biggest thing going on in her life right now. As most of you have learned by now, uh, Ron, who suffered a stroke several weeks ago, uh, looked like he was improving some, took a turn for the worse on Friday, and passed away on Friday night. Uh, Ron's uh, visitation will be on uh, Tuesday. Uh, the service will be on Wednesday morning, uh, Charles Lehman uh, Funeral Home in Bluffton. Uh, so I've been in communication with Charlotte. Uh, she appreciates all the thoughts and prayers from everyone. Um, and uh, just remember them and her entire family at this difficult time. Do we have others we'd like to share? Jean. Um, yes, from uh, Facebook, Mary Ellen uh, uh, wants to say a special blessing to John and Gary for coming to the rescue of two women this week. God bless you both. <laughs> My, uh, <clears throat> I, when I got called up to uh, Toledo Hospital on Friday to be with Charlotte, uh, my mother, and uh, who that request came from, and... Um, and my daughter and my two grandkids were at the house, and they decided they were going to walk down the park, and they got themselves locked out. <laughs> and I'm in Toledo. I can't help. And so John and Gary came to their rescue. So thank you both uh, for being so kind to my family. Uh, anything else you'd like to add? Lori. Uh, Scott's having a breathing test done tomorrow at Bluffton, uh, and then the following Monday he will um, be seeing a pulmonologist. So just some prayers, and we have some good results from that, or some, or a way to go. Thank you. We will certainly continue to remember Scott. Are there others? If not, uh, would you uh, please join us in our prayer hymn uh, this morning? Uh, more love to thee on page 453. If you're using the hymnal, it's verses 1, 2, and 4, uh, or it's on the screen. You may remain seated uh, as we sing this.
Father God, creator and giver of life, we are so grateful for the opportunity to come into your house this morning and offer you worship and praise. Worship and praise that is so deserved. You bless us in so many ways that we cannot count and too often we do not express our appreciation and we ask for forgiveness for that. Lord, know that we love you and we, we thank you. And Lord, we know that you care about us deeply and everything that goes on about us. We know that you want the best for us and you know better than we do ourselves what that is. You're able to know what is on our minds and on our hearts before we can get them out of our lips. So, Lord, we thank you for being there for us and always being concerned. Lord, we thank you for the village of Mount Cory, its history, its people, and all that has meant over the years to so many. We thank you for the heritage that this church and the Bethel Church has played a part in those many years. And Lord, we just ask as we move into the future in the future years of this village that this house of worship will continue to be a meaningful place to spread your word and a beacon of hope in this community. And Lord, in the darkness of days when ugliness and hatred raises its head like it did 21 years ago today on that cloudless blue sky and we saw the smoke rise over New York City and Washington, D.C. and Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Lord, we, we need that beacon of hope in that situation more than ever. Lord, it may be 21 years, but for all those affected, the pain and the reality of the consequences of that day are still very much a part of them each and every day. So Lord, we lift each one up, each family, each community, each nation that was affected, and Lord, we just ask that you give them a sense of comfort and peace that only you can give. We pledge not to forget, help us not to. And Lord, we just know that you are in control and we trust you that you are in control of all. Lord, you are in control of the big things, but you're also in control of individual things. And so we, we can come to you and we can lift up our prayer concerns for you. We, we thank you for your presence with Charlotte as she went through this eye surgery. But we, she's had a, a terrible loss, as you know, with, with Ron's passing on Friday. And all those who know them and love them and care for them are affected as well. So Lord, we just lift up Charlotte and the family and friends, lift them up that you may give them comfort, give them peace, let them know that you love him and you love them. And Lord, as they go through these next few difficult days, help us in any way we can to be of support to the family. And Lord, we continue to lift up Scott as he has these tests coming up, Lord, we just ask that you provide answers through them and through the medical providers that can help him in the things that he's dealing with. We thank you for neighbors and friends who are willing to set aside their time to come to the beck and call when people are in need. Help us all to be willing to do that. And Lord, we have so many that are listed on our bulletins at our prayer list. You know what each situation needs and you know what each one requires and we just put our trust and faith that you will attend to each one in Jesus' name. And we came into the sanctuary this morning. We placed our tithes and offerings in the basket. We know it's far too small given what you've given us. But we do ask you to bless it. We ask you to bless the givers we ask you to multiply it and give us the wisdom to use it in a way that furthers your plan 
and your will for this congregation and this community. And Lord, there are unspoken requests on the hearts of those who are watching online or those who are here in this sanctuary. We take a moment to lift them up to you now. And Father, God, most of all, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, without whom the possibility of us being with you for all eternity would not even be in existence. And when our time comes, let us put our faith and trust in that Jesus who provided the pathway so that we can, for all eternity, sit with you and the angels in your heavenly home. And it is in the name of that Jesus that we pray the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture reading today is taken from Daniel 3, verses 12 through 18. But there are some Jews who you have set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshad, and Abednego, but pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshad, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshad, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshad, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Thank you, Nancy, and may God bless the reading of his holy word uh, this morning. Will you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as I told you a little bit about that story during our prayer time, uh, my daughter and my two little grandkids did come over to the house on Friday and spent the night, and um, the Grandson is two, going to be three in February, and the granddaughter actually today is 10 months old. And uh, so that uh, is exciting. And they came with all their stuff. And of course, in spending the night, um, Richie, the grandson, has uh, his Buzz Lightyear and his Zerg toys, and he takes that to bed with him. Um, and so we got him to bed Friday night. Of course, it's in some place where he's not used to be. Mom's in with the other one, uh, getting her down. And after a little while, uh, here he comes out, barely awake, crying uh, that he, uh, he just needed something other than those things 
to help him not be afraid. The Buzz Lightyear and Zerg just wasn't going to do it at that point. Uh, that wasn't enough to make him feel safe and secure. Uh, like the stuffed animals that all of us probably had when we were little, or blanket, you think it's Linus from the Peanuts carrying around his, his blanket. I had a, a bunny rabbit that was, uh, and it's still around someplace. I, I don't remember where I saw it last. Doesn't look too good anymore, but I liked it a lot. But anyway, we needed those things to feel, uh, feel safe and comfortable, but when we got frightened in the dark as a children, we needed to feel the presence of a loving parent, or in this case, a grandparent, to make them feel comfortable and safe, to go down and say, I'm here with you, it's okay, to let them go to sleep. And that worked on about the second or third time. Um, but but for, for, having said that, from an early age, we are wired to seek comfort and safety, are we not? We live our lives today with a focus on security in almost every aspect of our lives. And we're talking about personal security and we, we, we worry about uh, alarm systems on our house and, and uh, the uh, video doorbells that they have and uh, even maybe even getting a concealed carry license to protect myself uh, or uh, take uh, self-defense classes or all the other things uh, we think about these days, especially when crime is so rampant uh, everywhere, it seems. But we also, personal security, we also think about financial security. How do we manage what we have been received, what we've received? How do we budget? How do we, how, how do we put some aside to plan for those things that might happen in the future? Uh, so we have financial security. Then we have cyber security. Uh, always worried about somebody hacking into our accounts and uh, uh, on our system. We have our passwords and we have all of the other things we try to do, protect ourselves uh, online. And then the thing you hear about all the time is national security. And uh, that has been ongoing for all this long as nations have been together, uh, have existed, uh, how they relate to each other and what they need to do to make sure that they feel that their, their country is safe. And all of this, all these discussions of security leads us to discuss the next one of our American idols, and it is the idol of security. And you say, but wait, Pastor Mike, isn't security and taking all these precautions that you talked about, financial and personal and all of the other, to be safe, uh, isn't, that, uh, isn't that something good uh, so that we're able to live our lives safe and comfortably? And yes, it is. But like the stuffed animals and the security blanket and, or the Buzz Lightyear figure, if that is where we put our reliance for our security, it won't be enough because it doesn't last. Let me demonstrate. If I were to make the statement, if blank happened, or if I had blank, then I'd be okay. So how would you fill in that blank? How does our world or our culture tell us, what does our world or culture tell us to put in that blank? Now, as good church-going people, we know from the time we're little kids that if any question gets asked in church, if you answer God, you're right most of the time. And that you would be right here too. But let's put that aside for just a second. We know that to be true intellectually. But let's take a look at our lives and honestly examine them and look at how we are living them. What do our lives suggest we are putting in that blank. If I had an alarm system, then I'd feel safe and I'd feel comfortable in my home. If I had a million dollars, all my problems would be gone. I'd be happy. If I only owned a gun and could use it well, I could protect myself against anything. If I had better insurance, I might get better health care, then I would live longer. And I'd be protected. And on and on and on, you can add any kind of thing into that blank. And are all these things bad? No, not in and of themselves. But too often what we put in that blank is what we come to believe is the source of our comfort, 
our safety and our security. Yet the truth is, all too often, the thing that we put in that blank, the thing that we answer, makes us more insecure, more self-centered, more alone. And I, as I mentioned before, it isn't lasting. Like the old country song that some of you may be familiar with, looking for love in all the wrong places. You can paraphrase that in our discussion here. Looking for security in all the wrong places. Looking for comfort in all the wrong places. Let me give you an example of how this plays out. And we're going to go back to the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, the 13th and 14th chapter. And leading up to this, what has happened is that the Hebrew people have been led out of Egypt by Moses and they're in the wilderness. And God has promised them the promised land. And the, he said, it is yours. I give it over to you. And so he was instructed and he followed the instructions to get one person from each of the 12 tribes and send those spies out to go ahead and look and see what is up there in that promised land. And if you recall, when they came back, they all reported that it was, a, it was a wonderful land flowing with milk and honey. But 10 of them said, but there's a problem. There are these large people over there and they're very powerful and they would annihilate us. We can't go there. We might as well turn back. Two others, Aaron being one of them, said, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, yes, we may seem like grasshoppers to them, but grasshoppers plus God is bigger. So what did they do? How did the people react to these conflicting reports? If we read in the 14th chapter, starting at the first verse, it says that that night all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to just go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader to take us back to Egypt. Now, where did they get things wrong? First of all, they had this misconceived notion about what it was like back in Egypt. Was it comfortable? Were they safe? Were they secure? Oh, maybe things looking back out of fear of the future, the past, as bad as it is, may feel less intimidating. But after all they had been through and after all God had brought them through and after all the miracles he had shown them, let's go back to Egypt. And they were weeping, it said. They wept. But see, the thing is, they were weeping not in prayer. They were weeping out of their complaints and grumblings about God's plan. Didn't believe that God knew what he was talking about. And not only that, they questioned God's character. Why would God do this? Why would he bring us out here just to let us be killed? Wouldn't it have been better if he just let us go where we were? Even though they were crying out for centuries for God to free them. And then, let's pick a new leader to take us back. Not God's chosen leader, Moses. They're rejecting him. You know, we would like to think that we live our lives differently than that. But sometimes when we get focused on comfort and safety and security to the exclusion of all else, we live as if God doesn't exist. What is best for us, we ask, without factoring in God into the equation? What will make me the most comfortable? What will keep me safe? Aren't we supposed to live by faith and not by sight? 
But yet when we saw the sight of those buildings come down 21 years ago, the weeping turned us towards God, not away from them. God, how could you let this happen? No, God, deliver us from this evil that is here in this world. See, we're so used to peace and safety here in our country today. Our worldly lives aren't too much touched by it. See, we're, we're not in an era where our daily lives here are affected by war, unlike the people in Ukraine. Our children are not threatened by starvation. Hardly. We got an epidemic of overweight children, well, overweight adults too, if we're honest. We don't have to worry about whether we'll have to sleep outside tonight. If worse comes to worse, we know that we have friends who have resources to help us and we have insurance and our, our savings accounts and our, our locks and our doors and our airbags and our seat belts and our helmets and you know, we have our passwords and our secrets. We're protected. The problem comes in when we see our comfort and our safety as being essential, but God is not. I got everything covered. I'm all protected, God. You're not needed. Then the question becomes, are we more committed to safety than we are committed to God? And then suddenly things happen that rock our world to the core. For most of our existence as a nation, we had comfort and took comfort in the fact that we had an ocean to our east and an ocean to our west, and that would protect us and insulate us from all the bad that's going on over there. Then 21 years ago this morning, we found out those oceans didn't protect us. And we were rocked to the core. We thought we were safe. We thought we were secure. And then a couple years ago, we are attacked by this invisible plague, this pandemic, this coronavirus. That changed everything, changed how we did things, how it changed how we did church, changed how we saw each other and interacted with each other. It made people sick and we lost people. And it was something new and we didn't know how to deal with it and we didn't know what we were even dealing with at the time and our feelings of safety and security were gone. And even in the events of this past week, over in the United Kingdom, Great Britain, the passing of Queen Elizabeth, who had been on the throne for 70 years. You'd have to be at least 75 or 80, probably, to even remember a time when she wasn't the monarch of that country. And now, all of a sudden, she's gone. And they're all become unmoored. Well, what's going to happen now? What's life going to be like? We know what it was going to be like under her. She's been around forever, but now she's not. Now what's going to happen? See, it's okay to find comfort in things and try and take precautions, but don't make those, that's the highest priority in your life. When you make it the ultimate authority, you take away the authority and power of God to provide the comfort and strength and safety that you need. That external authority, that father figure, that parent figure who comes alongside in moments of darkness and in the scary, in scary times and says, I'm here. It's going to be all right. Safety and security on this earth makes us feel better. But it is ultimately an illusion. And clinging to this illusion 
of safety and security will actually make us more vulnerable on the day Jesus returns because we're putting our faith in something other than him. See, we know from our life, we know from our experiences throughout our lives that things happen that shake us, that we can't be protected from. When we see a loved one die unexpectedly, when planes bring down buildings, when violent storms destroy people and neighborhoods, then where does our protection and security come? See, by clinging exclusively to earthly safety nets, we're refusing to fully trust in God and pursue his priorities. You know, we say we're Christians, we want to follow the example of Christ, right? Well, Jesus didn't pursue safety. Jesus regularly did and said things that were not in his best interest. And ultimately, he chose to die by placing the eternal lives of others, of you and I, over his own life. And we see another example of this in the scripture passage that Nancy shared with us this morning. Three men in captivity in Babylon, but they were not going to be dissuaded from trusting in their God. Despite the fact that the king Nebuchadnezzar had created these rules and, and set up this golden idol for them to worship and ordered them to do so, or else they'd be thrown into a fiery furnace. Most of us confronted by that choice, okay, well, I guess I'll bow down for a minute. Because we didn't want in that fiery furnace but we aren't trusting the right source at that point. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. I told the king, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hands. They trusted the God who has the ultimate power. But these next few words are so beautiful and telling of their faith. Because he goes on and says, but even if he doesn't. Even if he doesn't. We will not serve your gods or bow to your idols. We put our trust and faith in our God. That's where our hope is. That's where our security is. That's where our safety is. And if he doesn't protect us and save us here on earth, if we keep our trust and faith in him, he will save us for eternity. And that's for a lot longer than we live here. See, ultimately, earthly safety and security are lies. Because nothing can keep us fully safe and secure. We can build bigger and safer cars. People are still going to die. We can develop the greatest technology and the most effective medicine. People will still die. We can have the biggest military and the most destructive weapons to protect us. But people will still die. We say, well, Shouldn't we try to do those things? Shouldn't we make safer cars? Shouldn't we have better medicine? Shouldn't we have a strong military? Do those things, are they bad? Of course not. But because our God is the one that saves and he exists, we don't have to live fearful of the darkness, but can live pursuing the light. See, people of darkness pursue safety and security as the ultimate goal and the highest priority. People of the light pursue faith, hope, and love. And to pursue things of God is often not safe, folks. God places it on your heart to give to a certain ministry or give to a certain charity, and it's not in your budget, and it's not in your financial plan. So do you say, God, uh, 
that's a nice idea, God, but no thanks. I've got to protect my financial future. It's in the plan. When we get an urging to make a career move that isn't for title or money or other, but it's something that God has put on your heart that says you need to be doing this. This is where I want you. I say, no thanks, God, because I'm, I'm plenty comfortable here. I'm okay. I'll do what I can for you over here. God calls us to confront our fears and to take into account the God factor that he is ultimately in control and our safety and security for all eternity is based in him. If we love and trust him and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we already have that promise. We are already safe and secure. And there's people that say, okay, I'll do that. But sometimes it asks us to do so much and I can be, a, I, I don't need to be a part of a church to know all that stuff. I don't need to go to church. I can be a Christian without that. Well, yeah, you can, but you're making it awful hard on yourself. See, when we have these things put on our heart that God wants us to do that are beyond our strength, beyond our mind, beyond our plan, that are uncomfortable, we need a community of people who believe as we do to support us in those decisions. To help us see what we are doing is good in the eyes of God. We all trying to do it alone out there. And scripture says, when one falls alone, they're in trouble. I want to share these last words with you. Words from David writer of many of the Psalms, and one of the longer Psalms he wrote was Psalm 18, has 50 verses in it, and this was written right after he had been saved from the pursuit of those who were trying to kill him and run him down and search him in, in, in Saul, and he wrote these words, and I want to share them with you. Now, the first few verses of Psalm 18. The whole thing is beautiful. I suggest you read it, but here's how it starts. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation and my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I am saved from my enemies. Friends, may those words be ours this day, that the source of our true security, the place of our refuge, the place of our strength, is in the God we worship. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for being there for us in times of darkness, in times of when we are frightened. Lord, we know that we can come to you. Help us to see beyond the present circumstances of our fear or our anxiety and look to you for the comfort and the assurance that only you can give and that only you can provide that will last. Open our eyes and our minds to opportunities, not only for us to do that, but to help others around us do that as well, to encourage them on the way. And that we put our ultimate hope in you and you alone. In your precious and holy name we pray, amen. Will you please join us in our closing hymn, which be found on page 557, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. It's also, the words are on the screen. And if you are able, 
Please stand. And now until we meet again, the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.